Hi everyone, my name is Christina Asa from Fujifilm Visual Sonics and I'm going to moderate today's webinar. It's a very exciting day. We have Diego Dumani who's giving a talk on the functional photoacoustic imaging for assessment of metastatic lymph nodes. Just a couple notes, housekeeping notes about today's webinar. Just to let you know, a recording of the web webinar will be made available. So if your colleagues weren't able to join today, we can send them a recording and it will be made available through our website. All lines are muted for the duration of the webinar, but if you have any questions, we encourage you to please pose them in the chat, uh, the question window on the right-hand side of your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the session by Diego, and we expect the presentation to be approximately 45 minutes leaving us a nice uh, 10 to 15 minute window for questions. So a little, little bit more about our speaker for today. Diego Dumani is a PhD candidate in the biomedical and engineering um, faculty at Georgia Tech and Emory University. He is a research assistant in the ultrasound imaging and therapeutics research laboratory under Professor Stanislav Emelianov. His research interests involve the use of ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging for cancer diagnosis and therapy monitoring. His goal is to combine these modalities in conjunction with contrast imaging to diagnose lymph node metastasis in oral and breast cancer and mediate photothermal therapy. Diego got his Bachelor of Science and Master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Costa Rica and a Master's of Science in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. So without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Diego for a very exciting presentation and I hope everyone will enjoy. Thank you so much, Christina, for the introduction. Hello everyone and thank you for attending this webinar. My name is Diego Dumani. I work at the uh, Ultrasound Imaging and Therapeutics Lab at Georgia Tech and Emory. And I'm happy to discuss with you all some applications of photoacoustics to assess uh, both healthy and metastatic lymph nodes. So the motivation for this talk is that despite advances in prevention, detection, and treatment of cancer, the disease remains the second leading cause of death in the United States. There are a variety of mechanisms and hallmarks of cancer. However, the critical one is invasion and metastasis, which is what I will be focusing on for this talk. And this is because mortality of the majority of patients is due to metastasis and not the primary tumors. So we'll be discussing what is currently being done in clinic to detect metastasis and how it can be improved with the use of photoacoustics. There are two routes that cancer cells can take in order to invade other tissues and metastasize. One is the hematogenous way, or spreading through the blood vessels, and the other way is through the lymphatic vessels. For many types of cancers, such as breast or melanoma, the preferred path is through the lymphatic system. So as you see on the image on the left, prior to invasion, tumors prepare their surrounding environment by sending signals, enzymes, and substances that induce changes in vessels and lymph nodes. And these changes can be morphological and functional, such as variations in size or oxygenation. There can also be a remodeling of internodal sinuses or intracellular venules that will affect the distribution of immune cells. And there also can be dilation or growth in the internodal vessels of the lymph node. So taking all these changes into account, there are mainly three types of lymph nodes we're interested in characterizing. One is a uh, naive, healthy lymph node. Then there's the pre-metastatic lymph node that is already undergoing functional and morphological changes in preparation for the cancer cells to invade. And then there's the metastatic lymph node that has already been invaded by cancer cells. So if I summarize the changes that I mentioned, we could focus on three main uh, processes or changes that we want to identify. One is uh, the changes in the immune cell distribution. distribution. Then there's hypoxia induced uh, in the lymph node or a reduction in the oxygen saturation. And then there's inflammation uh, both uh, inside and also in, in the internal uh, vessels of the lymph node. So what's currently done in clinic 
It's called, uh, it's a procedure called sentinel lymph node biopsy, where physicians uh, would inject a radio tracer and a staining dye into the tumor to allow for drainage to the sentinel lymph node, which is the first lymph node that a tumor will uh, drain towards. So that's the, the lymph node of interest. Then this, this lymph node is localized using a gamma probe to detect this radiation. The physician will remove the lymph node for biopsy. And then a pathologist will perform histological examination to, uh, to test for cancer cells. However, there are various limitations of this clinical standard. One is the use of ionizing radio tracers, which is a safety issue for both the patient and the physician. There's a morbidity associated to the extraction of the lymph node. There's a need for an additional specialist, and moreover, there's also the potential to miss small micrometastatic lesions. So the need that we're trying to overcome is of the need for an accurate assessment of sentinel lymph nodes with a low morbidity associated to this procedure. So if we think of specific diagnostic needs, we would like a technique that is not ionizing, that is safe for the patient and the physician, that is cost effective, can give real time results, and that is versatile enough to be adapted to the current clinical procedures. And one technology that fits all of these requirements is a combined ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. And these, these two modalities provide a synergy that uh, allows to see both morphology or na anatomy in addition to functional imaging and molecular imaging. So for those of you who are not familiar with photoacoustic imaging, the way it works is you irradiate a laser into the tissue where different photoabsorbers will convert the light into heat. Then this heat causes a rapid thermoelastic expansion that emits a um, broadband pressure wave centered at the photoabsorber. And this pressure wave can be detected with an ultrasound transducer. So there are various photoabsorbers that can be used to generate contrast in photoacoustic imaging. Some of them are endogenous, including blood, melanin, lipid, and water. And they allow to study physiological processes, such as blood oxygenation. In the near infrared, there is a region known as the tissue optical window, which has minimal absorption by these endogenous agents. So it allows for deeper light penetration. So in this region is where exogenous agents can be best visualized. And they, by using them, we can enable functional and molecular imaging. Among many exogenous contrast agents, nanoparticles are widely used in photoacoustics due to many benefits that are shown here in the slide. There's biocompatibility and really high uh, molecular absorption and many other benefits. So back to where I started, I'm going to be showing some uses of both uh, photoacoustic imaging, ultrasound, and contrast agents to be able to visualize these three changes in the metastatic lymph nodes. And first, I'm going to start with a disruption of immune cell distribution. So previously, we started studying this uh, contrast agent called glycotidocin-coated colmeno particles that allowed us to visualize uh, the lymphatic system. And part of the, the characteristics of this contrast agent are that they are biocompatible, and they do not have a high absorption in the near infrared. But when they are endocytosed by cells, they can aggregate, and because of a process called plasma coupling, their near infrared absorption is enhanced. And by this enhancement, we enable photoacoustic imaging in relevant uh, tissue depths. So as I mentioned, this, this is what the uh, spectrum of these gold nanoparticles would look up on endocytosis by cells. And with this, we could use a system such as a uh, vivo laser to perform either single wavelength or multi wavelength photoacoustic imaging. In the experiments I, I will be showing, or the results I will be showing uh, later, uh, were performed using the system with a 40 megahertz transducer in the 680 to 970 nanometer uh, laser wavelength range. 
So one of the big questions we needed to answer when trying this contest agent in vivo is which cells are going to take these nanoparticles. Since we're trying to image immune cell distribution, then we're interested in seeing whether the immune cells will be effectively uptaking these cold nanoparticles to enable their near infrared uh, contrast. So we have performed in vitro studies where we compare the uptake by squamous cell carcinoma cells versus macrophages, which are immune cells. And what we found is that the uptake by the immune cells was very high compared to the cancer cells. So when we tested this uh, agent in a healthy mouse, we found that the distribution of the gold nanoparticles in the lymph node was mostly located in the subcapsular sinuses, which is where macrophages are abundant. So this further proves that the, the macrophages uh, like these type of particles, the immune cells like these particles, which is beneficial for our application. So um, for this uh, characteristic or to, to study this effect in the metastatic lymph nodes, we came up with, a, with an approach that we call immunofunctional imaging. And I'm going to be explaining how this works. If you have a mouse that is bearing a tumor and inject these nanoparticles in the tumor, we already showed that the immune cells will like these particles and uptake them, enabling near infrared absorption. So this is a, a cartoon that depicts this effect. Only the particles that are inside of cells will be visible by photoacoustics. And then these nanoparticles are transported by these immune cells towards the sentinel lymph node, which is the first lymph node of the path from the tumor. And the whole immunofunctional imaging result is based on whether there is a presence of metastasis or not, because when there is metastasis in the lymph node, the, the accumulation of these nanoparticle loaded cells will be different, will be disrupted due to this metastasis. So this effect, we can visualize it using photoacoustics, and it can give us a point of whether this lymph node is potentially metastatic or if it's healthy. So the results I will be showing were performed using a metastatic breast cancer model uh, using MDA and B231 cells. And we performed a peritumoral injection. This is an injection around the tumor. We allowed for 24 hours that uh, immune cells would uptake and transport the particles to the lymph node. And then we performed ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. So this first a pair of images, what you see is a regular conventional D-mode image that helps us to localize uh, the lymph node. And this is where the synergy comes in, right? Because uh, ultrasound will allow us to see the anatomy, the pathology, and by this we can localize the lymph node. And then when we add photoacoustics, we can see the distribution of where the immune cells that are carrying the nanoparticles are. So we can see the lymphatic vessels and also how the cells are accumulating in the lymph node. And remember, this is 24 hours after the injection, so the particles have already been uptaken and transported towards the node. So if we use the B-mode ultrasound information to segment the signal and only focus on the lymph node, we can see that there's a difference and the accumulation in the areas where the signal accumulates is different depending on whether the lymph node was a healthy uh, node or if it was metastatic. And if I zoom the image, it, it's more clear that there's a, um, an important difference in this accumulation. And what we did is we quantified these differences and we noticed that there's a significant reduction of more than 20% of the accumulation of um, nanoparticle loaded cells in the metastatic lymph node. So this is not a signal reduction. This is the area of the lymph node taken by these immune cells, which shows that there, there has been a disruption associated with metastasis. So the images I show you were single wavelength images at 680 
nanometers, which is where the uh, cyclohydrous and the gold nanoparticles would absorb the highest. But we also perform to quantify to make this quantitative analysis. We perform multi-wavelength imaging. And what we did is we took a ratio matrix uh, method. So the way this works is we will enhance the contrast of those pixels where the spectrum has a high ratio of high or of, of 680 to 830 nanometer wavelength, which is uh, matching what the characteristic spectrum of these nanoparticles have. However, we also added another pair of wavelengths to be able to reject the signal that is coming from deoxygenated hemoglobin. So there are very various methods to identify or to, to decompose spectroscopic images. And the, way we, the reason we chose this one is because it's a very simple method. And at the same time, it is independent if the spectrum of the gold nanoparticles is changing slightly with slope. It's still going to have the same uh, ratiometric trends. So this allows us to both visualize the particles that have aggregated slightly or the particles that are very aggregated, so very large aggregates. If the spectrum changes, we can still uh, identify those. And for this particular approach, the last step we took was the histological analysis, which is remember what the clinical standard does. And we found, as I mentioned before, in a healthy lymph node or non metastatic lymph node, the gold nanoparticles were accumulated mostly in the subcapsular sinuses where the immune cells accumulate. And in the metastatic lymph node, we what we found is that there is no overlap with immune cells and capsular cells. And this is very important because, as I showed before, in vitro we tested that the uptake of macrophages was higher than the uptake of cancer cells of these gold nanoparticles. However, in vivo, we needed to confirm that we're not imaging both cancer cells and immune cells because otherwise our whole approach will be compromised by this uncertainty. But we've successfully tested or showed that the cancer cells are not taking these nanoparticles. So what we are imaging is effectively the immune cells in the lymph node. So moving forward, in the changes that we see in pre and post metastatic lymph nodes, I'm going to focus now on hypoxia or hypoxic conditions that are caused by this uh, presence of cancer cells or the preparation of the that the tumors perform on the lymph nodes nearby prior to metastasis. And this study has, was done in, in our lab um, a couple of years ago. And the images you see on the left are label free images. And what this means is we're only using endogenous contrast to generate these photoacoustic images. And the, the benefit of this technique is, again, you don't need to inject anything. It's, it's completely non-invasive technique. And this allows us to image both oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And by combining those two results, you can generate a map of oxygen saturation in the tissue and in the lymph nodes of interest. And in this image, is, you see that as the metastasis or the nodal involvement of the cancer cells increases, there is a decrease in the oxygen saturation in those particular nodes. And again, this can be qualified, and, and there, there is a significant difference when the lymph node is metastatic, the oxygen saturation is considerably reduced. And last, I want to mention how we can use ultrasound and photoacoustics to detect the inflammation or the dilation of the vessels inside the lymph nodes that are also a pre imposed metastatic condition. So what we did for this particular study is we used um, a nano droplet, which is a size of 200 and nano, 250 nanometers. And this nano droplet, we can activate it with laser. So in its liquid form, it's 250 nanometers. But once we activate it, it can become a micro bubble that is around one micron size. 
And this phase change enables ultrason contrast of this agent. So what you see on the top left image is that the the contrast changes over time, and then we can use the time series behavior to detect our our agent, and then generate a, a contrast or background tree image. So, what this does to help us study dilation or inflammation inside the lymph node is that these nano droplets are sized or have like the perfect size to study the threshold where the a healthy lymph node will not allow a, a nanoparticle of this size to penetrate. It, but when it starts to inflame, when it starts to dilate, preparating for the invasion of cancer cells, then it's going to start enabling or allowing more nanoparticles or, or of bigger size to penetrate the lymph node. So the changes, again, we can study them using this contrast agent and combine ultrasound and photoacoustics. So to summarize, I, I presented the different ways that you can use ultrasound and photoacoustics to study immune cell distribution, disruption, hypoxic condition, and inflammation and dilation of the lymph nodes. Two of these would need external or exogenous contrast agent, but hypoxia can be studied with label-free uh, photoacoustic imaging. And I would like a, to add a bonus uh, topic, and this is multimodal imaging. So, so far, I, I mentioned various ways to see the changes in the lymph nodes, but there's still one important part of this assessment that includes can we see the cancer cells or can we see if the cancer cells are there in the lymph nodes? So what I wanted to show is this uh, contrast agent that we have also used that is based on the liposome encapsulating J aggregates of indocyanin and green, which is a dye that is FDA approved and commonly used in the clinic. And what we can do is we can add targeting moieties or antibodies in the surface of this agent. So we can use it to target cancer cells, or we can also use it to target macrophages and immune cells. So we just pick one or the other. And what is particular about this agent is that it's responsive to the environment. So it will change both its optical uh, properties, its photoacoustic response, and also has a fluorescent response. It will change based on the environment. So the way the agent works is we inject it, and once it interacts with the target itself, it will break apart, and it will release the aggregates of ICG. And the ICGJ aggregates will become um, monomeric ICG, which is what induces the optical changes. So to show you what these changes are, this spectrum that you see on the left is associated with the the a trace nanoparticle, the intact nanoparticle, and once the particle is broken apart, there will be a blue shift of the optical spectrum. So this can be detected by multi-wavelength photoacoustic imaging. And if we want to do multi-model imaging with photoacoustics and fluorescence, then we can also detect that fluorescence activation once the nanoparticle is digested or broken apart. And this fluorescence is comparable to that of free ICG. Die. And it's, uh, the image I'm showing here is an in vivo validation of this cell interaction. And what we've shown here is uh, we imaged both the injection site and the lymph node with the particles drained after we inject this, and this was a healthy mouse. So what we see here is how the immune cells interacted with this nanoparticle. And you can see on the right that there are two very different spectrum that you can use to compare if the particles have interacted with cells or not. And this enables various possibilities. You can use this to detect uh, the presence of cancer cells. And if there's a very small cluster of cancer cells, that sensitivity could be enhanced using uh, fluorescence. And you can see the spectrum difference using photoacoustics. So it's a very attractive application. And Last, I want to add my second and last bonus slide, which is regarding therapy guidance and how photoacoustics can help in not just detecting, but also treating these metastatic uh, lesions and lymph nodes after you 
discovered that they are metastatic. And what I'm showing here on the left, if you remember my slide when I showed how port acoustics works, there's a, a parameter called Gurnaisen parameter, and then this changes linearly with the temperature. So if the temperature of the tissue is increasing, we can see a variation in the photoacoustic signal based on this temperature change. So the way we can use this, and what I'm showing here is a, a validation experiment um, in a tumor in vivo where we injected a contrast agent and we irradiated it with a continuous wave laser that induces heat. And what you can do is you can map the port acoustic signal to changes in the temperature. And this can allow physicians to perform hard ther ther therapies and procedures and then perform image guidance to track the temperature and make sure that all the cells uh, or all the targeted cancer cells are dying and at the same time all the healthy tissue is not being affected. Moreover, we can also detect different physiological changes during the procedure. So as you can see here, we detected an increase in temperature. And then there's a, a small decrease that is probably caused by an increase in the blood flow that, again, this stress of the procedure is causing in the, in the vessels and tissue. So to summarize, I explained uh, three main ways we can use photoacoustics and ultrasound to detect changes in the immune cell distribution in the lymph node, changes in the oxygenation, and also the dilation and inflammation of pre and post metastatic lymph nodes. And then I also included uh, multimodal and multifunctional therapy imaging applications. With that, I would like to Thank you all for attending this talk and your, for your attention. I would like to thank Visual Science for inviting me to share all of this research with you. And uh, I would like to acknowledge my research lab at Georgia Tech and uh, nanohybrids at Austin, Texas for providing the PA trace, the multimodal the nanoparticles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego, for that very interesting uh, and multivariant uh, work you're doing uh, I think it was very much appreciated on our end and certainly I think on the audience end as well. So at this point, I'd like to encourage everyone to use the questions panel on the right hand side of your screen to enter any questions you might have for Diego about uh, the work he just presented. So to start things off, I have a couple questions that have been submitted. The first is, uh, Diego, what is the need for tumor margin ID and lymph nodes lymph, in lymph node metastasis assessment in breast cancer? Excuse me, can you repeat the, the first part of the question? Absolutely. So the question is, what is the need for tumor margin identification uh, for, in lymph nodes for metastasis assessment in breast cancer? Um, well, so, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the metastasis is what will determine uh, for a big part of the prognostic factor is based on the presence of metastasis in the lymph node. So there's a big need. The tumor emerging, it is, while it's still also of, of prognostic factor, I think it's, it's not necessarily of uh, direct translation of whether the lymph node will be or will not be metastatic. I think what's more important is the, top, uh, the tumor molecular or genetic characteristics. I think this will affect the, since there are many, many types of breast cancer um, tumors. So I think that that's a, a more important characteristic that we would be interested in uh, seeing of the tumor. Great, thank you very much. Uh, another question is, how small of metastases can you actually be visualizing in mice using photoacoustic technology? This is a, a question we, we are still trying to address. And some of the studies with molecular photoacoustic imaging showed that uh, the lesions that can be detected can be as small as the ones that a pathologist can detect. And this is where also the multimodal imaging works because if you are focusing on a very small number of pixels with photoacoustics, but you have a fluorescence signal that you can also add to it, then those will enhance the sensitivity a lot. 
for the three functional methods I, I presented, that question that is something we're still trying to address because some of these changes start to happen even before there is uh, a cancer cell in the lymph nodes. Okay, great, thank you. So we're getting some more questions in. And two related questions are surrounding some motion artifacts. Uh, so one audience member said, uh, nice time series images in the inflammation section. How did you control for breathing and other motion artifacts? Was it something like gated acquisition? And similarly, another question posed uh, about your oxyhemo data. Um, yeah, so, so for movement, there's definitely uh, various methods that can be used to account or like you mentioned, time gated acquisition. For these results that I showed, we did not perform any uh, time gated acquisition, but we just performed uh, spatial filtering that still enabled us to detect the nanoparticles, mainly because the node that we were focusing on was uh, far away from the rib cage. So the movement artifact from the mouse was not very important in, in this case. It was not affecting that much. Okay, great. Another question, what is the mechanism for nanodroplet infiltration to the lymph node after IV injection? Yeah, so, so this mechanism is, is something we, we still are in process of studying, but the, the main change that we are showing here is that if we had injected these same nanoparticles, and this is a result that I just didn't show here, but if you inject this in a naive mouse, a healthy mouse, with no dilation in the lymph node, the vessels will not, um, will not or, or the particles will not infiltrate the lymph node as they do with these. So I think the mechanism is just the internal vessels, internodal vessels are starting to dilate so they allow more, um, more flow of these particles inside because these vessels are, are tiny. So if they are smaller than the particle size, they will just not allow them to get in. Are there any effects from converting to microbubbles within the tissue, such as any tissue damage that you saw through your studies? Well, there, there can definitely be some effects. We, for this particular studies, we did not study the damage. Uh, however, these, these droplets have been studied in other different scenarios, and there, there can be a concern if, uh, if this vaporization can be causing damage, but I think it, it, there's, a, there's a, a leeway that we can uh, control this to avoid having a, a damage cause. So I think the, the answer is yes and no, but we, uh, we can control it to make it a no. So another question we have that came in is, what is the sensitivity to temperature changes of photoacoustic thermo thermometry, uh, something in the ballpark of five degrees Celsius, one degree Celsius, do you have any concept of that? Yeah, so I don't have the, the exact number on top of my head. What I can tell you is that um, ultrasound has also been used to, to detect changes in the temperature and photoacoustic sensitivity compared to the ultrasound-based uh, methods are more than tenfold. Uh, I cannot tell you it's uh, like a 1% per 0 0.1 degree Celsius or, or uh, the exact number, I don't really, I cannot really tell, but uh, it's, what I would say is a very relevant sensitivity for the changes that you want to see in patients. So if you're increasing from 42.1 to 42.2, well, maybe that's not what the physician cares as much as increasing from 40 degrees to 43 degrees. You can definitely see a, a, a way enough increase in photoacoustic channel for those type of changes. Thank you. Another one is, uh, are there are droplet conversions temp temperature dependent at all? I would say they are, yeah. So, so there are various factors. Um, affecting their vaporization or their phase change. There's um, a pressure factor, so the, the peripheral carbon inside of them, the boiling point of it, it's actually um, lower than the body temperature. 
So the pressure of the particle itself will contain it from vaporizing until the laser is induced. So if you increase the, the temperature, for example, you know, if you combine these with uh, uh, hyperthermia therapy or something like that, um, the temperature would definitely affect, uh, to some extent, if you increase the temperature too much, then the, vape, uh, the particles will vaporize more easily. All right, great, Diego. Thank you so much. Uh, so we won't grill you for too long here, and we'll end our session for the day. I, again, I want to, first of all and foremost, thank Diego for his excellent work and the excellent presentation, as well as answering all of our audience questions. As well, I want to thank you all for tuning in today to check out our webinar. And I just want to remind you to continue to connect with us visit our website. We also have a customer resource portal that has a lot of interesting information available to you. Uh, if you if you require any uh, support, you can submit a question or a request through our web forms on our website, and our team will be uh, quick to get back to you. Also, please pay attention. We have a webinar schedule. We have one more that's webinar that's upcoming shortly so uh, be sure to check back on our website to register for the next webinar as well as checking out our past recordings you can find us on all of the social media channels listed there as well as many, as well as at many conferences and you can go on our again on our website to look at all the conferences we attend so you can actually visit us and put a name to a face at our booth if you, and if you have any questions specific to products and technology, please contact our customer support form again on our website. So thank you very much, everyone, and have an excellent day.